Good afternoon, and welcome to the Advanced Leadership Track Session, the BitCon Protocol and Future Currency Impacts on the Engineering Profession. Today's session will cover what digital currency means for the engineering profession, beginning with the failure of the NAFTA Mutual Recognition Document for Engineering Professionals between Canada, Mexico, and the U.S., followed by an introduction into blockchain technology like Bitcoin, and ending with specifications on how our profession can jump to the top of the value chain in the era of social capitalism. Today's speaker is Dan Robles, PE, who has enjoyed a long and diverse engineering career in aviation, construction, education, and community organizations, and has worked in the US, on the US Space Shuttle, commercial satellites, large aircraft commissioning, and major renovations to high-rise buildings. He even worked in a special effects for notable Hollywood productions. However, his most profound experience was his involvement with the NAFTA Mutual Recognition Document for Engineering Professionals. In fact, he earned his master's degree in international business so he could articulate what he'd seen in the kitchen of the NAFTA MRD. Dan feels we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to shift the profession, giving the technologies before us. Please join me in welcoming Dan Kroglis. Thank you very much. Thank you all for showing up for coming. Um, this is a, uh, a fairly dense lecture. I hope um, there's three parts to it. If we get through the, f the first two parts, it'll be great. And if you want, we can continue or we can stop for questions. And this year is the 20th um, anniversary of the NAFTA mutual recognition, um, NAFTA agreement and, and the mutual recognition document for engineering professionals. NAFTA was unique in the fact that it included the free trade in goods and services, um, specifically financial services and engineering services. This was the first of its kind trade agreement. And while most people saw NAFTA as that giant sucking sound that was, was going to deprive American jobs and cause all this competition. I was a, a young engineer at the time. I was, just got off as a, as a test engineer in the space shuttle. And I saw NAFTA as an incredible opportunity. Here we have an entire hemisphere that needed everything that engineers made. Roads, bridges, highways, hospitals, infrastructure. So this was a huge opportunity. And then when you bring in the financial services part, there was a way to pay for this. Okay, so this is just amazing. So I had an opportunity, and I went down to Mexicali, uh, and I got a job at a small private university um, right there on the border, and teach, teaching engineering classes in English. And the first thing that struck me about these engineers was how smart they were, how committed, how well they worked together. The collaboration skills were just extraordinary. And being a test engineer, of course, I wanted to test them to a known standard. So I, I prepared, a, I selected a group of 12. I prepared them for the EIT examination. 11 of them passed. Okay, so this is, <laughs> this is mind-blowing stuff, okay? So I, um, I came back and I said, okay, now I need to get, uh, it was a significant of two regards. One is that they passed, and two is that I could predict who would pass. Now this is significant, the ability to predict the likelihood of a future event. Okay, the second, um, second time we did it, I, I, tried, I tried to get a random sample from across the, the school, and I got about 35 kids. And they went and they passed the exam with a, with a rate of 55% compared to the United States 65%. And I was measuring a language disparity factor of about 15%, which meant that the fact that the exam was in English was slowing them down about 15%. But this is still an extraordinary pass ratio. So here's a picture of a larger group of about 100 of them. And we had taken a sample of all of Baja California, Mexicali, Tijuana, and Ensenada. And the California State Board was just wonderful to us. They gave us this, this beautiful gymnasium right across the border. Um, and we sent, eventually sent 250 Mexican-educated engineers to the EIT exam. Now, this was not easy to do. Okay, how do you organize these people? How do you get them to take, put so much effort into taking this American examination? So after the first group passed, I went to the administrators, I went to the students, I went to the teachers, said, hey, let's do it again, let's do it again. I'm like, no, nah, we don't want to do it. Well, why not? You, you, you can work in the United States. And in the, contrary to popular opinion, 
Most Mexicans do not want to work in the United States, period, okay? Didn't affect them. No, we don't want to do it. Well, make more money. And they look at you, they laugh at you, and say, well, money doesn't buy happiness. Hello? Okay, because they really get that. So I was about to leave the country. I was really frustrated. didn't want to do the program. Finally, I said, look, this is an opportunity for you to go head-to-head, pencil-to-pencil. All their money, all their power, all their influence cannot help them learn this exam. They are at the same level as you. It's an even playing field. When that happened, you could see the upswell of passion in these people, and they just, they, they can't resist a good game. I mean, who could on the even playing field? This is how Mexicans have fun. So they literally built this program, which eventually prepared and sent 250 engineers to the EIT. They, they hacked the NCES exam. How do you do that? They looked at the exam, they looked at the weights, they looked at the averages, they looked at their advantages, they looked at their disadvantages, they created a program, they had an English language disparity practice test. It was amazing what they did, given an even playing field, to do this. So this is a very profound experience. Okay, so to get an idea, you're looking at these engineers, and they're extraordinary engineers. And you look at this country that was relatively backwards, 20 years ago especially, and you wonder, you know, what's the problem? How, how did this happen? So if you look at economic development, if you look at all of our economy, you see it's a platform. And that platform is held up by basic infrastructure. Okay? And there's this three-legged stool relationship between banks, insurance, and engineering. Because with basic infrastructure, like a, a building or a bridge or a highway, there's a period of time when the money going into the project and the revenue coming out of the project where nothing happens, where that where that asset is virtual. It does not exist because it's undergoing the soft process of design and construction. During that, if if the asset doesn't exist, it just falls off the financial statement. Okay, so what engineers do is they keep that asset alive on the financial statement through design, process, and, and investigation, and inspection until revenue comes. So they serve a very, very important purpose for bridging a period of time. So if you couldn't maintain that asset on a balance sheet, then the insurance company doesn't think it exists and they won't insure it. If they can't insure it, then the banks will not lend to it. So you have this very important process of base infrastructure. So looking at Mexico, you see the problem was not engineering. Their engineering work was magnificent. The problem is the banks and insurance. The financial industry was, was segmented. So that was a problem with, with Mexico, why it's not as, as developed an economy as ours. So this is a very important relationship. Um, it gets a little deeper. I'm going to show you my numbers. This is, the, this is the fundamental equations to all this. An asset must be defined in, in two forms, with two variables, quality and quantity. So if I say water, that's not an asset. Because is it six ounces of water or is it six liters of water? Okay, that's your quantity. It's still not an asset because is it drinking water or is it processed water, like keeping your engine cool while you drive down the freeway? Okay, this is quality. And we talk about quality, we don't talk about ranking from zero to one or one to ten or good or bad. We're talking about completely two different value propositions, drinking water and processed water. The quality is in what the the value proposition of the asset. Only those two pieces of information are, are required to define an asset. If they're not there, if one of them is missing, the asset disappears. Risk is the variance. So is it good drinking water or bad drinking water? That's where we handle the goodness and the badness of things, in the risk, the variance of expectation. So it's a very, a lot of times we get that confused, what quality is and what quality isn't. So professional engineering um, is largely a function of quantity, quality, and variance. And we see that our education is the quantity it's a civil, mechanical, electrical. Our experience is the quality. Another engineer tells you, is this an aerospace, or is this a contractor, or is this a, a civil engineer experience? And that's, that's the quality. And the examination process determines your variance. Okay, so you, it doesn't, you know, if you get 100% on your, on your exam, it, brings, it doesn't matter. Or if you just pass the threshold, it doesn't matter. It just lowers the threshold of variance. So that's all the boring stuff. We're going to get away from that. But I had to show you my numbers because that's what engineers do. So now we're looking at the NAFTA mutual recognition document and why it failed. The United States education system had an accord with Canada for um, substantial recognition of their education program. Of course, engineers would accept each other's opinion of what engineering was, 
but they had different examinations. So at least two of the three standards were in full compliance. So you still were able to define an asset. Whereas Mexico, they didn't have the same education system, they didn't have the same examination system, and the only thing you could, you could, you could use to compare them was experience. So when you have a combined NAFTA um, system, experience is the only standard that everybody understands, and they had to jack that thing up to 24 years experience to get your NAFTA PE. And we used to joke about all these geezers running around the desert. I mean, just entirely impractical. But the, the reason why NAFTA failed is because you could not define the asset. It could not be financed, and it, insurance companies would not back it. Okay, so somebody come, came along and said, hey, why don't we all just take the same examinations? That'll work, won't it? And everybody's like, no, 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 we won't do that. He's all the negotiators from NAFTA. We can't do that. And then somebody said, well, there's this guy down there in Mexicali who's sending all these engineers to EIT, and they're doing fine. That's how I got suckered into NAFTA. So our recommendation was that everybody take the same examination. It would be published in Spanish. It would be published in French. Everybody would accept each other's experience. We would use that ed the examination to feed back into the education system and bring it into um, compliance over time. Okay, now I wasn't trying to throw a hot potato into the whole thing. I was just trying to preserve the asset. I'm a, I'm a test engineer. I'm trying to preserve my variables. I'm trying to control my variables. Okay, but anyway, the NCES said, no, we can never give the exam in Spanish. And then the Mexicans say, well, well that doesn't sound like a very even playing field. We, we, don't, we don't approve of your education because we, hire, we need more social services in our education. And they have a point there. They have a lot more social services in the shows. So that's how NAFTA fell apart. Now this is, this is tragic because NAFTA was the first of its kind trade agreement to include services. Every single trade agreement that followed copied NAFTA. Okay, so in a planet where every, all the laws of physics are the same on every single point, we don't have a global engineering profession. What happened was financial professions went right through the border, engineers got stopped at the border. And that's the disconnect that's out there now. And that's a disconnect that every other trade agreement inherited. Okay? So this is why NAFTA, the failure of NAFTA, the failure of engineers to cross borders freely was an absolute tragic mistake. Getting back to this diagram, our three-legged stool. There's um, two players here, banks and insurance companies. And whatever happens to banks and insurance companies are going to affect engineers. Okay, so right now there's a technology on the horizon which is going to affect banks and insurance companies. And if that happens, it's going to affect engineering. And that's called Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin as a currency is a sideshow. Okay, they call it money, whatever. Put that aside for a minute. That's not the important part of Bitcoin. The blockchain protocol that Bitcoin um, was invented on may be considered one of the greatest achievements of human intellect since calculus. This is serious business. We need to understand and dive into what that, what, what that blockchain protocol is all about and what it does, because in that lies a tremendous, staggering opportunity for engineering professionals. So in order to discuss the origin of Bitcoin and how it came about and why it's important, we have to look at databases in general. In the old days, we had these machines and your computer would tell this little tape machine to go 11 and a half meters down here, grab this data, go 12 meters this direction, a little bit of algebra tells it to go off and get that, bring those things back to me so I can produce an operation. Okay, that's how the tape machines used to work and very accurate motors would go and find that data, bring it back to the, to the computer. Um, nowadays, we have these incredible data systems and now they're capturing all kinds of data like you know personnel data, HR data, sales data, um, marketing data, product data, everything is all captured in these, big, in, these, in these big databases that corporations have. And it's tremendously efficient until you try to get one database to talk to another database. And then it just all falls apart. They just don't talk to each other. They can't talk to each other because they've been re the organization has been reified to the structure of the database. So you just really can't you can't get that to happen. So what they've done is they've invented, um, there's a lot of service positions which exist for the sole purpose of converting data from one database into another database or into another form. And generally, this service sector are, are, are typical of brokers. 
there's insurance brokers, there's, um, there's mortgage brokers, there's real estate brokers, and this is all they do. They, and there's healthcare system in your government and dealing with the, MV, the DMV. It's all about going from one database and converting it to another database. And this process is highly labor intensive. So they invented something called an API which is an application protocol interface, which is a little computer program that can kind of squirrel up into one database and grab the data and almost kind of find where it needs to go here. It's got problems. Um, Amazon, for example, they issue their API to vendors so they can interact with the Amazon database and so forth. But still, you have these modern day brokers. You have these inefficient systems that you're getting all these global databases trying to communicate with each other. So it's, it's becoming very labor intensive, very resource intensive. Um, and you, there's brokers everywhere. I mean, I can't even email you $10 because it would cost me $11 to do it after you pay for all the, all the, all the fees and the banks and you know, all this stuff. So it's a huge friction. I mean, um, MasterCard alone takes 2% of the entire retail economy. I mean, how do they do this? Um, so what if you can get rid of this? What if you can just, just get rid of this entire swath of brokerages? I mean, wouldn't that be cool? Well, you know, they try. And one way of doing it is to merge databases. Um, and corporate mergers are an example of this. Two companies will, will join, they'll merge their database, and they never hire people, they always lay people off. And that's where they discover efficiencies. Um, another way to um, enjoy this, this the, get rid of these brokers is to share a common database. So if everybody has a common database, everybody feeds from the same bucket of data, then you don't have this problem. It's very efficient. You can now do tremendous things. The only problem with this is, what's to keep me from going giving myself a raise? Or what's to keep somebody from double spending the money before it can clear accounts? What's to keep somebody from accessing another person's private information? Okay, so that's a very big problem. It also is the exact problem that Bitcoin solves, the Bitcoin protocol. What it is, is a set of handshakes which allows access for certain people to certain places at certain times in certain ways. It's truly, um, it's, the term for this is called decentralization. You may hear this in the near future. But it starts with something, with something with encryption, encryption technology or cryptography. It starts with something called a hash. And a hash is this huge random number that's generated by a computer. And then there's another computer program which takes this huge random number and fabricates two keys out of it. One's a public key and one's a private key. Now these two keys are mathematically related. They understand each other. They, can, they, they recognize each other. Okay, so a public key obviously is something you would you know, put a, on, a, on a distributed, you give it away or you give it to somebody. Your private key is something that you hold personal. So for example, if, if Bob wanted to send an encrypted message to Alice, he would write the message and he would lock it with her private key, with her public key, email it to her, and only she could open it with her private key. Okay, and then it, that's how it's encrypted. If it's intercepted in the middle, you can't read it. It hasn't been opened. So if, um, and likewise, Alice would take Bob's key, lock the message back, and it goes back to Bob, and he opens it with his um, private key. So now suppose you have Bob and Alice decide to have a shared secret. They can use both of their public keys to lock the box, and each of them have, can open the box. So there's all these different permutations you can do with this, with two keys. You could have three keys closing a box, you could have if, and, or, but statements, if this key and not this key, then this happens, and so forth. So there's, it's very um, exciting what you can do. You can actually program logic with, with cryptography. So there's something else missing. It's called the timestamp. How, how do you know if there's an agreement has been made. How do you know when one key was done before another key? Okay, you still have that a double spend problem. So what the Bitcoin protocol is, it's like, consider a bunch of vaults. They're kind of on a train and they kind of go, they open, they close, one leaves, the next one comes, opens, closes, and this kind of goes on forever. Okay, so when the box closes, the message, anything you put in there is cryptographically sealed forever. And you can read it, but there's no way you're going to change it. Okay, so the whole idea behind the coin and getting this thing to move is, is done by miners. Now, miners, what they do is they compete with each other to solve a puzzle. And that puzzle is difficult to solve. 
and whoever, when the, when, the bo- when the vault is open, whoever solves the puzzle closes the puzzle, closes the box. Now the solution to that puzzle becomes part of the puzzle that opens the next box. Okay, so you can never go backwards. You can only go forward. So that establishes a time stamp. It establishes a, a consensus, a ledger that everybody can agree to that this happened at a certain time, therefore it's a valid transaction. Okay, and, and, and for solving this puzzle, you get this little prize. It's called the Bitcoin. Now, this Bitcoin, people think that it has value because it does something useful, and surely it does, and then they can trade with it. So people start getting smart and say, well, I could, I could convert my money to Bitcoin. I could put it in a blockchain. I can email it to you. You can open it up, and you now have, you can convert that back to dollars, and now you have money. I've emailed you money. There's no banking fees. There's no transaction fees. There's no taxes. And nobody has any idea what I used, what, what, I, what I sent you the money for, because that's, it doesn't have to be part of the agreement. And that's what made it the perfect application for, for drugs and, and other things when they first started out. Um, then people got smart and said, well, look, you know, I could put an escrow contract on this thing. And I could say, okay, we're going to have a property transaction. I'll put the money in. You put the title in. If it turns out okay, then the algorithm sends you the title and sends me the money. If the inspection turns out bad, then I get the title back and you get the money back. All done cryptographically. So now you've wiped out the escrow industry. You've wiped out um, um, real estate industries. You wiped out a lot of different functions that are happening in the financial industry. So the first application took out banks. This one's starting to take out escrow agreements. Merchant banking is a huge process. It works similar to this. Um, and then people got really smart and said, well, look, you know, an insurance product is nothing more than the escrow where everybody with multi- a lot of people on it. So a bunch of parachute- parachutists would all throw 10000 bucks into um, an escrow account, and the person whose parachute didn't open, their family gets the money for the funeral. Okay, So this is something that insurance would never touch that kind of an agreement, but this is something that people can make, a new agreement that people can make among themselves using blockchain technology. So now you're threatening the insurance industry. You're threatening banking. So this scares a lot of people because, wait a minute, theoretically, they can thoroughly disrupt us. We can lose all the brokers. And at first, the banks and the insurance companies, they rejected Bitcoin, and they fought it tooth and nail. They did everything they could to just kill this thing. But mysteriously, they're now becoming the biggest investors in Bitcoin. And there's probably two reasons for it. One is that um, they can head off this upswell of competition. And the other reason is it helps them get rid of their own brokers because they are stacked on top of layers and layers of brokers and managers and all kinds of people, okay? So it makes them more concentrated, more profitable, more powerful. Okay, so there's a lot of activity adopting this blockchain technology today. So a minute ago, I just discussed legal contracts. Um, I discussed banking contracts, insurance contracts, can all go on the blockchain. There is a big, big problem with all of this which has not been solved. And a lot of you probably have a sense of what this problem is. It has not been solved. How do you represent a physical asset with a virtual asset? Nobody's willing to work in exchange for Bitcoin. They're not going to trade their productivity for this virtual asset. So there's a liquidity crisis. They can't convert these currencies to real money. They can't convert it. They can't get these transactions to become mainstream, no matter how hard they try. And there's a lot of pundits out there who will sit there and tell you, yeah, Bitcoin has this, this, the value of Bitcoin is in all the things that you can do with Bitcoin that you can't do without Bitcoin. Now, I mean, that's significant, but it's not intrinsic. At some point, this thing has to touch the ground. And it hasn't done that yet. That problem has not been solved. Eventually, they're going to need contracts where there's a third party who verifies that this asset exists, flips a switch, and allows that money to go by. Guess what? That's exactly what engineers do. We have the ability to sustain that asset from a virtual state to a physical state. Okay? in what we do, in our stamp, in our profession, in our association with the, with the legal industry, 
with the, our respect with the banks and the insurance companies. We have a tremendous opportunity to become an adjudicator of smart contracts. Okay, try to wrap your head around that for a minute. Um, it's hugely important. They can't do this without us. The only way to solve that liquidity crisis is by putting an engineer, a licensed professional engineer, right there in the middle. Okay, on basic infrastructure because basic infrastructure is what supports all, our, all, all other economies. So this is the opportunity we have to try to understand how we would go about doing this. How would we, would we need to reorganize ourselves so that engineering becomes a platform instead of um, a commercial enterprise. We have to start considering ourselves more like a financial instrument than like a commercial enterprise or a service. Okay? I mean, I just, I just got off the, I'm getting busted by a, um, a photographer who's giving me a hard time about using an image on a website. Now that image is something that one of our engineers actually designed. So why am I paying, why do I get harassed by a photographer who took an image of something that we designed? He should be giving us royalties for taking the picture of the thing we designed. It's because we're stuck in this archaic business model, this archaic finance model, and we don't understand what our function is in this bigger picture. And the opportunity is to now convert, because this new technology, we screwed up on NAFTA. We had a great opportunity to build a global engineering um, system, and we've got another chance to do it. Okay, And I doubt there's going to be a third chance, so that's why this is really important. This is something that we designed. It's called Curiosme. And this is a system by which we would reorganize ourselves as a profession. What it essentially does is it converts the engineering stamp from simply a way of sealing devices, uh, sealing contracts, which we do today, to a way of opening contracts as well. It converts our resumes, it converts our experience, it converts our knowledge into cryptography. Okay, so now we can have smart keys that work a little bit in between public keys and a little bit in between private keys to make decisions, to be adjudicators in these, in these contracts. Um, Curiosume is, is being built by um, the Ingenesis Project, and we are, um, I'm going to explain a little bit how, the, how it works. And then I'm sure we'll have plenty of time for questions. Okay, so I need to do a little bit more, a little more background work. There's three major engineering problems in the world today. If we were to solve those three problems, many of the other problems would solve themselves. Okay, the first engineering problem is competition. We are beating each other up for scarce resources, scarce jobs, scarce scarce air, scarce water, scarce transportation, scarce money, and we're beating each other up really, really bad. Competition is good for optimizing a game with an even playing field, but it's not good where, the, where there's asymmetric information because you're creating 10 losers for every winner. You're manufacturing losers to create a winner, and this is hugely, hugely inefficient. Maybe on a less crowded planet, but we, we can't get away with this much more. And there's a problem with asymmetric information. It's creating a moral hazard. If I've got more information than you, I can now withhold that information and take advantage over your game, or I can win your game on your behalf. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's a game that the Mexicans wouldn't even play. And they saw it right off. So we've got this asymmetric information. Where asymmetric information and where competition meet, You've got hierarchy. This is where we rate things in terms of winner, loser, right, wrong, best, worst, angelic, demonic, rich, poor. Everything in our society we rank in this, and we call that quality. But a few minutes ago I discussed that quality is really variance. Quality is not. The quality of, a, of an asset has nothing to do with good or bad. The quality of an asset has everything to do with its value proposition. Okay, so this is a fallacy in our culture. That, that maybe shouldn't exist, or maybe in some forms is unnecessary or inefficient. Um, even more so with technology, Clay Shirky um, gave us this idea, and he talks about hierarchy. This is a typical hierarchical map. Uh, we can, we're all very familiar with this in churches and in uh, 
schools and, and industry and corporations. And then along came the internet. And the internet allowed people to go from one point to another point by avoiding some of these hierarchical um, branches. Uh, then came a little more internet. And you see a lot more activity bypassing these hierarchical branches. Well, eventually, you can just take out the hierarchy. And everything remains. The system still holds. I like this picture because this is what dinosaurs evolved into. Instead of thicker armor, hiding behind bigger rocks, they grew wings. They changed, and they communicated. In a network, the only act, the, the core activity in a network is to locate each other. So we created this thing called Curiosity. Instead of writing a resume, you would tag yourself with Wikipedia articles. So if you're a mechanical engineer, you tag yourself mechanical engineer. Then you look at all the tags below, below that, you see fluid mechanics, you see some design, and you kind of start tagging yourself with all these different tags that are compared to Wikipedia. And for each one of those tags, you rank yourself, you rate yourself on a scale of student to teacher. And the reason for this is that students and teachers do not compete with each other. They have a completely different value proposition. Okay? In the middle, if you're probably in the middle, you're going to be a collaborator. And collaborators, when they interact, they iterate between each other very, very fast, and they produce stuff. This is what the innovation process is all about, that sort of production. So what do we have here? We have the demand, which is the student. We have the supply, which is the teacher. And we have the collaboration, which is our factors of production. We've eliminated asymmetric information. We've eliminated competition. Okay? We have a, a, a prototypical economy right there just by reorganizing ourselves in a very special way. Now, the activity of building these curiosities is eventually going to form a bell curve. This is how we observe ourselves. This is how we find ourselves using statistical um, tools. Okay, so what does this do for us? Well, first, let me, let me um, repeat this one more time. You tag yourself with Wikipedia articles. You self-select on a collaborative scale. And out pops this little code. And what you'll notice about this code is that the format of this code you see, tag one multiplied by s forms an asset. The quality and the quantity are married, plus the next tag times the asset. So you are creating these knowledge assets. It's like a car. Every component has a quantity and quality to it, but assembled, it's, it creates the car, which is a highly quality uh, unit. So what happens now is you create this big, this is what a curiosity would look like. This represents, this could represent an individual person. It could re represent a team of people. It could represent a product, a service. It could represent a, um, a group, a scenario you want to test. It can represent anything, and it's, in, it's sort of like a public key. And when you lay your private key on top of it, tremendous amount of information will be revealed. So if you're a mechanical engineer who's a rock drummer, you'll be able to find all the linkages between mechanical engineer and rock drummer, and that, dev that defines your value proposition. Okay, This is a different way of using data. If you look at Wikipedia, it's incredibly rich in the way these tags are put together, the way they're, they're, they're linking to each other. It's incredibly rich. And you can see, you can see some of those uh, here. And in this photo, you can see it's even closer. The resolution is pretty good. Now, if you're Boeing, of course, you can't build an airplane like this. But you could always link your wiki, wiki your internal wiki, up to Wikipedia. So you, do, you have the same function happen internally. But then eventually, you pop it up into Wikipedia, and you follow that through all the components of, of humanity, the way this is built by other people. It's, this, is, this defines us more than any other, any other, any other way, because it was literally built by people. So you start getting some very, very interesting information. If you start tracking the speed that things move, for example, this is an um, uh, uh, editorial war. I think it's between about, about Arab Spring or something. So something happens in this location. That wiki page is changed. Now, all the other editors who are linked to that need to change theirs to figure out what happened there and to build theirs up to speed. So this happens throughout the entire network. 
So what would happen if something happens in Washington, D.C., and within a couple of days, you know what the impact's going to be in Peoria, Illinois, or in Danbury, Connecticut, or in El Paso, Texas? This is tremendously valuable information. But what, what is this really called? I mean, is this new? Am I making this up? No, this is, this is big data. This is, this is what they do to us all day long anyway. Big data knows you better than you know yourself. Here's a picture of how, where you are. You're surrounded by social graph. You're surrounded by these cluster farms, these, um, these server farms, these databases, um, Dominion data, graphs. You're somewhere down there in the middle, and you, know, you just don't stand a chance. Big data is feeding back on itself now. So the big data will tell you to do something. You go off and do it. It takes the data from that action and feeds it to you again, and you go off and do more things. And things are happening in the world that we just do not understand because this data is feeding back on itself. Okay? So what does curiosity do? Well, we shut out the lights on big data. We can put a toll booth on big data because if we restrict productivity from the equation, we restrict... We restrict everything. So if you can hide yourself, or you can control your own identity, if they want to use your data, they're going to have to pay you for that data. Okay, then you would give them your public key. Okay? So this is, this is the same calculus that Wall Street uses. Okay? The, the word explaining here, this is the same calculus that big data uses. Except we're going to, if we were to use this on ourselves, on our own profession, we, could re we can change the model of what engineering is because we're so intimately connected with banks and insurance companies. There's another caveat to this. Um, we have to, absolutely have to include non-licensed engineers, scientists, mathematicians, youth, because they're the ones building this. We can't do it without them. So it's not a matter of flying our PE freak flag. It's about we need them to get this job done. On the other hand, they need us because we have that link with banks and insurance companies. We can span the virtual and the physical through our licensure. So we have to come to the table, span that bridge so that all our, our, our engineers can walk on top of it and get across into a new economy. Right now, there are people making decisions all over this globe who are not engineers, but they're making extremely technical decisions about energy use, about climate change, about whether you believe it or not, you know, these, these, these decisions are being made by non-engineers. But we stopped at the border 20 years ago while they just continued on. Okay, we did it to ourselves. But here's a chance to, to correct that. So that's what Curiosme does. Um, this is what we're trying to accomplish and I was invited here by, by a very, very um, forward-thinking president that you now have. And, and I'm deeply grateful to that. I think we have a fair amount of time. Um, are there any questions? Yes. One of the, one of the characteristics of, of Curiosme, and a lot of people have difficulty, is that you're self-rating. Okay, so where's the vetting mechanism? Who's to tell you that you're actually rating yourself correctly? Um, that's part of, the, part of your question, I believe. And the answer is that there's no incentive to cheat. So if you eliminate the incentive to cheat, you eliminate the need largely for a vetting mechanism. Because if you portray yourself as like the world's best arm wrestler, you're going to get challenged. You're, you're, you're purposely making an attention to society that this is how you want to interact with society. When you get to the point where you're collaborating with somebody and they determine that you're not what you say, it's going to be a, that's, that's your vetting mechanism. Okay, so the result of when you, when you have a, um, you should be able to predict the likelihood that a group of people can execute a business plan into the future. Okay, you're predicting a likelihood. It's not ever going to be 100% sure. But if you can predict that likelihood, likelihood you could predict, you, you could build a, an asset, you could build, you can collateralize it. Okay, you can insure it, because that's all you need for insurance is to understand. You have to be able to identify the asset, you need to uh, predict the likelihood that that peril will happen, and then you have to be able to determine the consequences of the deed, uh, of it going wrong. Okay, so this is where insurance comes up. If, the, if, if it doesn't, this is what insurance does. And if you give them the data, they can cover that. So if, you, if you're putting together a project, it doesn't turn out the way it, it, it's supposed to, well, that's what insurance is for. 
Well, if you're cautious, you can put yourself up as a, as a student or as a, or as a first level um, student. And you're going to go out there and you're going to be matched with an individual who's a teacher, but not the PhD, you don't because you know something about it. And you're going to be collaborating together and you're going to be helping each other out. So you're going to be allocated correctly. So the idea is not to, is not to uh, change the outcome, it's to allocate everybody correctly. Instead of forcing everybody to do the same job, like I, instead of standardizing the job statement and making everybody conform to that job statement, what you're doing now is you're allocating everybody correctly in, the in, in determining what job statement they can do. Well, Match.com, and many, there's many ways of matching data. Oh, no, it's true. It's true. It's a very legitimate question. Um, they use a set ontology. They define the ontology. They define you. Um, you know what color is your hair? I mean, you know what's your height, weight, proportionality? So they they're the ones who de define the ontology. What we're doing is we're using a centralized ontology called Wikipedia. Okay, and the tags which associate pieces on Wikipedia is is the general is the is the ontology that everybody's going to use. Or again, this could be any database. It could be your internal company database or wiki. I'm just, just putting it out there. That the ontology, you're not controlling the ontology, whereas match.com is. Okay, so, and you're going to be taking consideration for not only you know, somebody's, somebody's skills in mathematics or their skills in thermal or pipe design, you're going to also have empathy, kindness, Motherhood. There's no GDP measurement for motherhood, but it produces every single taxpayer in the country. I mean, how could you not include these things or try to run an organization without empathy, try to run an organization without kindness and respect? just doesn't happen. So these are now other elements that you can put into your complete curiosume, and there shouldn't be any economic incentive to do anything other than what you're naturally good at and interested in doing. Because if you try to do anything outside of that range, you're going to find a lesser economic output out, outcome than if you stayed in, in the things you like doing best. And, and that makes sense. You track the outcomes of all you do. And if you're doing great, if you're not good, well, you adjust. It can never go too wrong. Okay, if an individual has to leave a company, you can, you can map their knowledge assets and replace them with another similar one. Okay, so it allows somebody to leave a company and allows you to replace them a lot easier, but also allows them to find another place to go a lot easier as well. So it's sort of like a, a two-edged sword for an employer. They could lose people, but they can gain people easier too. So it's not, it sort of should be a net zero impact um, on most organizations. Ask your NSPE to consider your value proposition more like a financial instrument than like a service. Okay, look at it that way. Look at the Bitcoin protocol and find out how we can interact with that very important opportunity that I, um, I demonstrated. We have to research this. There's a lot of work to do. It's not, it's not done yet. And after that, um, we're building a, a pretty large coalition of, of engineers and developers in the Genesis project who are building this thing on, a, on actually a platform called um, BitShares, not Bitcoin. It's a different blockchain. Um, it has different characteristics which suit us better. So there's a lot of people working on this. There's a lot of people working on this. And there's one very important part that NSP needs to do, and we got to figure out how we're going to do it. You take a bridge. Okay, say it takes, you know, 20,000 engineering hours to build that bridge, and maybe another 100,000 construction to get that thing up. Okay, it's 120,000 hours of human productivity to create that bridge. Over the 100-year lifespan of that bridge, connecting two cities, you're increasing net human productivity by billions of hours. Billions of hours. That's the real value of what engineering is worth, not just the bridge. Okay, so what you're trying to get at is how do we capture that human productivity? So what we could do is we could form um, a cryptocurrency of our own, which we pay each other in this cryptocurrency. If we did enough so that you could, if I had trouble with a bank, I could call you up, you help me out, and we exchange this little note between us. Eventually, that cryptocurrency will come to represent value stored in infrastructure. It will have intrinsic value. Bitcoin does not. So if anybody was to pull off a, a coin, it could be us, if that's our intention. But we have to get to a new funding model. 
This, this is a 100-year-old funding model we're on. We're, we're, just, we're just getting beat up really bad out there. We can't, we're, we're, we're fighting for every penny. Kids don't want to be engineers anymore. I mean, how are we going to, say, how are we going to write this ship? And we have to do something radical, even if that means um, going right in between. Because the banks and insurance companies need us more than we need them. And we are in a perfect position to position ourselves where they are going. Not where they are now, but where they are going. If we offer ourselves up and say, look, we'll be your adjudicators. They'll say, great, now we've got liquidity for this cryptocurrency thing. They'll go with us all the way. They'll take us all the way to the bank. Not, not, not that way. But yeah. I think. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a theory. You know, don't quote me on this. I'm, you, know, you saw my numbers. I'm using a, a very basic fundamental equation, and I back everything up by that. Quality, quality, and variance. And it's, 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 it's defensible. Um, we have a session going on next on Book of Knowledge, right? That's the next, and we're copying the PMI, because PMI had tremendous success with the Book of Knowledge. Except our Book of Knowledge doesn't have to copy PMI. Who are they? Our Book of Knowledge could be a wiki, okay, which, which is our book. It's like Wikipedia, except strategically for engineers. That is what, if we're going to have that effort, let's do it that way. And then we can tag ourselves on this book of knowledge that we all create, and, and, and we go forward from there. The constraints are going to be time and proximity. Do you have time to do this thing for the banks? Do you have, are you close enough to go off and physically see something for the benefit of the banks? Those are the constraints. The constraints are not supply and demand for you. That's the 100-year-old model. That's the land labor capital model. It's gone. Okay, so the constraints are going to be time and proximity. Do you have time to get there? And then, then you could take a percentage of the value of that contract. Okay, this is what architects do. Architects take 8, 10, 12 percent of the value of that project. So if they want you to go inspect a bridge in order for the asset to not disappear off their banking statement, in order for, that, for them to not go you know, lose their stock value in the eyes of their shareholders, you got them, you got them pretty... You got it pretty against the wall, pretty good. And you can claim now, if it's a $100 million contract, you could take a percentage of that. If it's a $100 contract, you could take a percentage of that. Um, doesn't matter. You just have to allocate yourself pr pr um, properly. It's not a matter of competing anymore. It's a, pro it's a matter of proper allocation of your knowledge asset. Where is it, where is it optimized for you? That's exactly what we're going to do. Until somebody disrupts them. It's sort of like a Trojan horse. You know, they need us to get going, but there's all these upstarts who are going to do the same thing, and they need us too. So we're opening up the game for everybody by providing this critical link of taking a virtual asset and having it represent a physical asset. Do not underestimate the importance of that simple fact. This is exactly what we do and nobody else. Go someplace where there aren't engineers. And there's lots of places. There aren't a lot of engineers right now at all. I mean, you know, the thing is, with, with this, you'll be able to see where the other engineers are. Okay, because we're all going to be registered to the same database. So you all see where the other engineers are. So you go to a place where there aren't a lot of engineers. And then you go there until other engineers come, and then you start. But they're not going to really compete with you because you are a unique person. Three, three nodes into this thing, and you've got a unique identifier. Okay, there's nobody who has your experience in its entirety. Okay, there's people with equivalent experience, but not complete experience. You are an individual person, and you're going to be unlocking Con certain your key can only unlock certain contracts, and his key can only unlock certain contracts that match. Okay, and this is what's going to be driving: is the contracts will come, you'll unlock them with your key. You choose to take them or not. You put them back in the stream. They continue. You get percentage for everything. I mean, I'm, I'm actually hypothesizing at this point. I mean, I don't know what's going to really happen. I'm just telling you this is what the calculus tells me can happen. The mathematics tells us that this is the direction we can and, and probably should go. Don't worry about 
competition because things are always decaying. These buildings are all trying very hard to fall down. Okay, an airplane does not want to leave the ground. I'll tell you that. And these are all recurring events. So it's not like, you know, it's, it's a zero-sum game. It's just going to continue. And, you know, what I do now, my business is, is literally teaming up with independent engineers and we collaborate. It's called co-engineers. We collaborate. We don't compete. So I have no problem standing in front of a group of homeowners, homeowners or bankers or anything, and I'll get myself a little bit over my head, but I got Dave here. And I say, Dave, I'm stuck here. Help me out. And he'll come on board, and he's, he just knows everything. He's an older gentleman. So he doesn't want to write reports, so I write the report. He does the work. So we always find a way to collaborate, and he amplifies me. He doesn't bring me down. If you and I were to work together, you would amplify me. I would amplify you. That's what collaboration is all about. It's not about competition. If you're thinking in a competition mindset, you're thinking in the mindset of scarcity. Okay, we have to think knowledge is an abundant asset. It's not a scarce asset. You're still thinking in terms of land, labor, capital, scarce asset, money scarce, you know, all these things are scarce, room is scarce, elevators are scarce. You know, we have to move away from that. Yes, sir? No, some things can be done virtually. Some things can be, you know, you've got drones now, you can see things. I mean, whatever. I, I'm just saying it's just a, a completely different way of organizing ourselves. And we amplify each other. We don't, we don't bring each other down. We don't, there's no need to compete. Well, a project would be expressed in the same form as your key. So I look at a project. It's a, it's a mid-rise, needs a repipe. So you go to Wikipedia. Repipe, galvanized, age, class, building, location, water quality, yada, yada. It's all there. And I define the building in terms of, of a curiosity. And I put that out, and that's the public key. And all these private keys come and either unlock that or, or it passes. I mean, it's done algorithmically. It's done instantaneously. It scales magnificently. Not this resume, wait a week, you know, try to con some computer into dealing with your tag words, I mean, whatever. The entire country is a case study in, in deferred maintenance, my God. Anyway. <laughs> Are you trying to kick us off? Yeah. Okay. So we could pick this up. I'll be around until, until this evening. I'll be around until this evening. Thank you very much.